I am live. I thought I finished this chapter, which was interrupted uh, in the first reading, and it is chapter um, chapter nine, I think it is Chateau and Chatelaine. This is a lot to remember, a lot being a part of France, and um, she has dedicated this book to her husband's. Dennis and Charles with love for a lot to remember. Uh, she has a lot of visions in these journeys and um, this is her uh, account of these. Uh, Chateau and Chatelaine. I continue the last uh, paragraph so it's in context. In the oratory of St. Bartholomew on the 30th of October 1475, Antoinette de Cassonot de Bretonneau married her father's companion in arms, Robert de Balzac. It is a little surprising that he chose her instead of an Italian bride, for he had spent most of his adult life at the courts of Florence and Milan, and found their culture infinitely more congenial than that of France. He may have married her only because she was beautiful, and then found she was unbearably dull, or else she was too timid to face foreign travel, for when he returned to Tuscany as governor of Pisa, she stayed with her parents and only saw her husband when he returned for brief visits, during which he provided her with five children. One of these, his eldest daughter, Jehanne, he deeply loved, and frequently promised her that one day he would come home to build a chateau which would surpass any he had seen in Italy. When Jehan married Almeric de Montal, who was governor of the Haute Auvergne, Auvergne, Auvergne her, father, her father's natural province, she considered it her duty to stay near her mother, and so lived in the castle and so lived in the castle within sight of the ancestral walls of Castle Nau Bretonneau, which had been given to her as a dowry. Here, only a smile to the west of Saint-Cessaire, Saint she lived for the rest of her long life and, like her mother, had five children, two of whom died in infancy. She had been married for six years when, in 1503, her beloved father at last came home, but only to die, and in 1511, Jehan became a widow. Now she had no one to divert some of the consuming devotion she had always felt for her eldest son, named Robert after her father, who became the focus of her passionate emotional life. He was already showing signs of having inherited his grandfather's wanderlust, and so Jehan, being too intelligent to try to curb him by less subtle means, decided to create, within the outer walls of the castle, such a glorious Renaissance chateau that he would be forever content to stay at home. Nothing must stand in the way of realising this dream, and she launched herself upon the task as though trying to woo a cooling lover from a rival mistress. She even wrote to the king for his advice, and François Premier, no doubt touched by this maternal temerity, allowed her to employ his finest craftsmen. A foundation stone gives the date when the work began. Jehanne de Balzac, Dame de Montal, set ouvre fit édificier first, and this I cannot read. It was a Roman number, 15-something. It was not enough that the staircase be incompatible. The underside of each tread must also be carved, and carved in a manner worthy of the splendid chimney pieces and the ceilings of the serenely proportional rooms. Robert should have cultured youths instead of uncouth men-at-arms to serve him. So the, so, the, so the cell de Gardet is a setting for courtiers, 
with a walnut dining table six meters long which still gleams like wheat peat water and an inside stair to the kitchens so that the food which might help to keep Robert's friends contented in this quiet country district should be served piping hot. When she woke in the great bed under its baldaquin, whose yellow silk damask is neither faded nor frayed, although it is more than four centuries since it was loomed in Lyon, she must often have heard the clink of chisel on stone as a carver worked on the ennablature of the window or the lintel of a doorway or added a detail to a frieze. For because Robert, uh, because Robert had, Robert had been decapitated at the Battle of Pavia. I'm almost low on the battery, or well, to empty. In the torment of bereavement, Jehan refused to be comforted by the fact that she had a younger son, Dordé, Dordé, who had entered the church. She must even have looked on him as the usurper of Robert's inheritance, for when the Pope decreed that Dordé be released from his own vows, she replied indignantly that she would infinitely prefer the line to die out. But her wishes were overruled, so that Montal should remain in the hands of a powerful Catholic family, and Dordé reluctantly gave up the austerities of his monastic life to live under the more rigid discipline of his mother. The Pope demanded an heir, and so an heir must be provided. Dordé was given no choice in the matter, for Jeanne selected as a daughter-in-law her niece, Catherine de Castelnau. Jeanne, Jeanne's daughter, Anna, she also lived at home, although she was married. But the Dame de Montal never relinquished a moiety of her authority and had outlived them all when, as a very old and lonely woman, she at last died. Was it Jehan or Robert who returned to rescue Montal during the early years of the present century? If it were neither, why did the petroleum millionaire, Maurice Fennel, immediately decide on seeing the striped and desolate shell that he would devote his energies and fortune to restoring the chateau to its former glory? Montal, some thirty years earlier, had been bought by a speculator who had sold not only the furniture but all the carved stonework except the staircase, which fortunately proved too difficult to move. Some of its passing into private hands, although the majority went to museums in England, America and Germany. Maurice Fennel indefatigably traced each item and brought it back, often after considerable opposition from museum curators. But the longest wrangle was over a chimney piece, which he eventually traced to the house of one of his cousins, for, as my informant Riley remarked, no one ever drives so hard a bargain and still remains quite so disagreeable as one's own relatives. Each stone was fitted meticulously back into the space from which it had been ravaged, the work being so well done that it is difficult to believe that this lovely chateau was ever in need of restoration. When Maurice Fennel died in 1937, he left, Montreal, he left Montal to the state. His eldest daughter, the Comtesse de Billy, still lives there, and the portrait bust of Jehanne and her father and her husband and her two sons and her daughter and her son-in-law look down on the courtyard and the east wing, which was too sorrowful to finish. So, uh, this book was published in 1962, uh, Joanne, uh, John Marshall Grant died in 1989. So this is history. Next, chapter 10 of Fear and Fidelity.